everyone. Welcome to the virtual red bench. If you don't know me by now, I'm Abby, the director here at the Vermont Ski and Snowboard Museum. Uh, the museum is a nonprofit organization and relies entirely on the generosity of our members, donors, and sponsors. I talk about funding a lot. It is always at the forefront of my mind because it has to be. It's what keeps us going. It's also really hard. Uh, since the Red Bench Speaker Series has been virtual, we've had thousands of viewers tune in compared to a few hundred. Not only has hosting this series become one of my favorite parts of the job, but it's also an opportunity to bring in some much needed funding for the museum. So if you are able, please consider donating. We're truly grateful for every single dollar. And as always, as a small way to say thank you, we'll be raffling off two pairs of darn tough snow socks. Each donation in increments of $10 will be entered and I'll draw the winners tomorrow. Uh, we owe a great deal of gratitude to our Red Bench sponsors. I wanna thank Trap Family Lodge for supporting this event tonight and our series sponsors, RK Miles, AJ Ski and Sports, Scholler Textile, Sistler Builders and Vermont Ski and Ride. Without their support, this series wouldn't be possible. So tonight we're celebrating women empowering women. We're joined by five Nordic Olympians that will discuss how they helped pave the way for today's medal winning women. These stories, in fact, the stories of 53 women are part of a new book, Trail to Gold, The Journey of 53 Women Skiers. The book is available in our gift shop and online store. We have limited copies left, but we'd be happy to order more if enough people are interested. Um, moderating tonight's event is Peggy Shin. Peggy is a senior contributor to teamusa.org uh, and has covered seven Olympic games. She's an award-winning writer and has contributed to nearly every North American ski magazine published in the last 25 years. She's also an author. Her second book, World Class, The Making of the U.S. Women's Cross-Country Ski Team, delves into how the current U.S. Women's Cross-Country Ski Team began finishing on the podium, which is quite fitting for tonight's event. Peggy is also the 2019 recipient of the museum's Paul Robbins Journalism Award, which is when I first met her. Uh, we will be answering audience questions at the end. So type those into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screens. We will get to as many as we can after the discussion. I now hand this off to Peggy to introduce you to the women you see here on the screen and get the discussion started. Okay, so two years into the pandemic, I am still a bit of a Zoom Plots. Um, I was the one who started the meeting early. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, I'm going to try to share my screen here. Um, we're here tonight to talk about Trail to Gold. Oops, my weird background. Um, it's this great book that came out in November, I think. I've got the date right. Um, <clears throat> and tonight we have a panel of five Olympians to tell us about this book um, and how the book came together. Uh, first, some background about the book. In 2013, Matt Whitcomb, who's the US women's coach, who was the US women's coach at the time and is now the head coach, uh, got the women then on the US team involved in a team building project. Um, they were each tasked with connecting to, with the um, 40 plus Olympians, female Olympians who had come before them. They're all still alive and almost all of them are still skiing. Um, I'd like to say all, I haven't just haven't talked to everybody yet. Uh, and to learn, he wanted the, the current team members to learn more about them and their ski careers. Matt thought it would inspire the current team members to learn more about them, the women who blazed the trail for them. And eventually Matt wanted to turn these athlete-led interviews into a book. Um, he told me about the project in 2016 as I researched my own book, um, World Class, that Abby just talked about. And... I, I was intrigued because so much of what I was writing about hinged on the challenges that all the previous female ski team members had faced, from chauvinism to body issues to training techniques to lack of funding. For instance, the women who first competed internationally in 1968 had to borrow small blue knickers from the men's team as a uniform. Um, and of note, women's cross-country skiing was added to the Olympic program in 1952, but the U.S. did not send a team until 1972, so it was a 20-year 20 year lapse. Um, by comparison, these challenges would show what the current team was doing right, or you know, how they were building upon what these women had learned. So when Sue Weems spearheaded the project to create Trail to Gold, I for one was thrilled. Uh, here were all the stories from 53 Olympians. I wish I'd been able to talk to all of them. I just didn't have time um, to, 
tell the story in their own voices about both their tribulations and their triumphs. Tonight, we have a panel of five of these Olympians who are going to talk about their experiences competing for the US and why they think Trail to Gold is an important book. Three of the Olympians were on the book committee and were instrumental in bringing Trail to Gold to fruition. So I'm gonna hand it over to Sue. Um, Sue grew up ski racing in Southern Vermont and watched and switched to cross country skiing while midway through attending Middlebury College. She made the World Cup team her first year out of Middlebury and the 1984 US Olympic team the following year. She raced all four events in Sarajevo. She continued racing internationally for two more years, including the 1985 World Championships. Following her departure from the US team, she became a ski coach, uh, working with many different age groups. And she has spent the last 21 years teaching skiing at Great Glen Trails in Pinkham Notch, New Hampshire. She's married to Howie Weems and lives in Randolph, New Hampshire. And she just got back from Norway. And I'm gonna introduce the other four Olympians as they start uh, their, their part of the presentation. But I'm gonna hand it over to Sue now to talk about the book project. And Sue, I was hoping you could tell the audience why it was important for you to see Trail to Gold come to fruition. Yeah, well, I'm very, very proud of this book. And it was a, it was a group, a team effort. Um, I think it's quite unique in that it, it was, um, it's written by us, you know, it's we, the, the women skiers who competed for the U.S. in cross-country skiing. Um, so it's very authentic, it's very personal, uh, very genuine, and it, it shares our stories. And there really, I don't, I don't think there was a lot available on the history of um, U.S. women cross-country skiers Actually, Peggy, I think, you know, your book really was maybe the first or, or first that I really knew about. And so once what really, I think, got things going was the achievement of the gold medal by Jesse Diggins and Keegan Randall in the 2018 games, um, you know, we had been chasing after that achievement for decades and finally, U.S. women topped not only won the first Olympic medal, but it was gold, and that um, energized us. And so um, we, as a group, started coming together, and we had a, a really great reunion, first reunion at the 2019 World Cup in um, Quebec City. And it was great because we were able to cheer on the current team and get to know the current team, and then the next year we were going to have another reunion and the pandemic hit. And so we weren't able to have that reunion. And so we started having some Zoom meetings to communicate, keep our group together. And, and at one of those Zoom meetings, you know, the enthusiasm for creating a book came about. Um, and I know I, um, I definitely felt like I wanted it to be, us. I wanted, you know, as much as possible to, to have each one of the 53 contributing. And so because people are busy, you know, my initial thought was, okay, kind of make a sort of simple ask um, and have people do like a yearbook entry. Um, and, and I guided suggestions with, you know, saying, okay, your high points, your low points, what you've been doing since the race bibs off. Um, and started getting a good response, but other members of our group had had bigger visions um, for creating a book. And I'm super glad that that they did. And so, um, you know, and we also started collecting anecdotes and a book committee was developed um, and just started collecting the pieces. And then uh, actually two of the panelists uh, tonight were super, big players. Uh, Nancy Fiddler, she was the one that volunteered to take the stories of the 1972 team and weave it into the first chapter. And, you know, I feel like we were doing this, we were pioneering this whole book effort. And, and Nancy took that first step uh, to, to compose that first chapter and did a great job on it. And, and we were off from there. And, and Nancy um, then composed uh, 
four of four more of the nine chapters and and would use um, anecdotes and and blogs um, and we made specific asks of of our members for material um, and really you know the chapters were following themes and and uh, so really super job by her and then I wrote a couple, I composed a couple chapters, Dorcas Den Hartog um, composed one and Betsy Youngman composed one. And then um, another, I feel like sort of unsung hero, but super important in our effort was um, Leslie Thompson Hall, who's on the panel. Leslie collected the photographs that accompany the book. And there's lots of them, each, each one of the 53 skiers has you know, her own page with a photograph and Leslie chased those down and got the permission to use those and then also collected photographs to accompany all the chapters. So um, they were really big players, um, but you know, we got contributions from so many members and it was this great team effort and I'm, I'm thrilled with how it came out. Um, and I, I, you know, I hope the people that have uh, opened it up have really learned a lot and and come to appreciate the the journey of us through our ski careers. Um, that's that's a great introduction to the book. Um, I thought we'd go through now uh, talking about the book. The first chapter is called Breaking Trail and um, I'm going to introduce Trina. Uh, Trina Hosmer started cross-country skiing in 1966 while a student at UVM. Her future husband, David, encouraged her to train with the UVM men's team, which he also helped coach. And of course, there wasn't a women's team. Uh, she would race uh, a few other women after the men had finished their race. And two years later, Trina and David moved to Seattle, where Trina improved her conditioning running with the Falcon Track Club, home to the best female distance runner in the world at the time. She cross-country skied in the winter and in 1970 made the first U.S. women's team competing at the World Championships. She raced four more years, including at the 1972 Olympic Games and 1974 World Championships. And in 1974, she retired from racing and she and David moved to Amherst, Massachusetts. Trina worked at the, at the University of Massachusetts for 32 years, raised two kids, and continued to occasionally cross-country ski race when time allotted. Uh, once they retired in 2005, the Hosmers moved to Stowe and began to get thoroughly involved in cross-country skiing again. Trina founded the New England Women's Cross-Country Ski Day. She runs a weekly master ski program in Stowe and has won countless medals at World Masters Championships. And I think she's just back a few weeks ago from another World Masters. So Trina, why don't you take it over and talk about those early years you know, how the 1970 and 1972 teams came together. Ooh, I think you said everything. <laughs> uh, well, the 1970, in 1970 is where it began when the U.S. team, ski team, announced that they would take a women's team as well as a men's team to the World Ski Championships, which uh, were going to be held in Visaki Tatri. Um, at this time, we were living in Seattle. Uh, Dave was pursuing his PhD, and I was running with the Falcon Track Club, uh, coached by this incredible man, Dr. Ken Foreman, and it contained probably, well, she was the best the female distance runner in the world uh, at the time. She'd been in a couple, Doris Brown Heritage was her name, she, or is her name, uh, she had won the international cross country uh, running me for five years in a row, a couple of Olympics. And so training with the best in the world, I upped my fitness uh, in a hurry. So when they announced, and I was still doing some uh, skiing at the Kongsberger Ski Club, which was in Snoqualmie Pass about an hour from Seattle. So when they announced they were going to have these tryouts for the team uh, in the East, primarily Vermont, then Dave encouraged me to go back and try out for this team. So I did. I went back by myself. Um, 
and made the team for women. And so then when the 1972 Olympics came around, then the precedent had been set for women's teams. And so they had to send us or send a women's team to the Olympics. So what was your other question, Peggy? <laughs> oh, um, so what was it like racing against some of those, you know, you were racing against a lot of Soviets and the Scandinavians yeah. who've been dominating. What, what was that like? Intimidating. <laughs> In 1970, especially, um, this the Cold War was still going on. And uh, just the year before, the Soviet tanks had driven down the streets of Prague and bombed buildings. But the competition, though, was held um, high up in the Tatris, uh, beautiful spruce forest. Um, trails carved in among the trees and then these ugly cement high-rise buildings were built for to house the athletes and we happened to be in the same building as the Russian athletes. I don't think that was an accident and they were um, the women athletes were totally surrounded all the time by these huge uh, that's, I say, huge because chaperones that had full length um, fur coats, hats, and they were not allowed to look at us or even speak to us. So, so on the courses, um, when we were out training and these uh, Russian women looking absolutely huge, you know, would just fly by us like we were standing still. But um, anyway, so we were, you know, totally humiliated and intimidated before we even started the races. But we did race. Um, we certainly weren't on the front page of results, which is only the top 15. But we weren't on the last. <laughs> we weren't the last either. And so we're going along until the relay happened and I got to start the relay um, which was a little overwhelming to say the least um, but I did get a front row start but I was right next to a pretty significant ditch on my left hand side and so you had to stay in your tracks for a certain length before you could move. So the gun goes off, I'm skiing along and all of a sudden I just hear this, huh? and a huge growl and this woman just came flying by me, knocked me over, um, went into the ditch, it was very <laughs> humiliating, uh, but had to get up, finish, and so I could tag off to my teammates. So it, it was, it was overwhelming, and especially for me, because uh, I had only been skiing at that point a few years. So, yeah. That's, that's one, of, one of my favorite stories from the book. Um, <laughs> it, it's Trina's story of, of her experience in that relay. And showed, yeah, showed well, her determination. <laughs> I didn't have a choice, so there was people depending on me to finish. So I did, yeah. And the book also has some great anecdotes for, uh, you know, showing what you guys had to deal with, with, you know, funding and traveling, oh. and outfitting yourselves and waxing your skis, where you got to put them. Yeah, we, um, I mean, the, the difference now is like when I went to the Olympics, I had one pair of skis. Um, now, you know, they go with minimum of 20, one for our cold, hard snow, warm, soft snow, clister snow, blah, blah, blah. And then we had, we picked out the wax, kick wax, and waxed our own skis tip to tail. Um, whereas now they have wax technicians who not only uh, pick out the wax, but the appropriate skis and then they wax their skis so it's just uh, mind-boggling to me and we only had you know the classical technique whereas now they have you know uh, the freestylers better known as skating we primarily did stride 
uh, technique for a classic, whereas now, unless it's a uh, incredibly steep hill or uh, a technique control zone where they have to stride, then they'll double pull the whole thing. Um, oh, and yeah, as for sponsors, I mean, <laughs> no sponsors. I remember uh, going, when we were in Sweden once, we went to the Edsman Ski Factory and oh, they gave each of us a pair of skis. And I thought I had died and gone to heaven to be given uh, such a gift. Uh, but yeah, the only support we had was the U.S. ski team did pay for our travel expenses and some clothing, but otherwise it was us or our families um, for everything else. But one thing we certainly had in common with all the uh, current skiers uh, is that we all loved to ski or we just couldn't, wouldn't have spent that much time on the sport, yeah, so. Trina, Trina has a really great story in the chapter called Magic of Wax too. It's very, very entertaining and humorous, though it wasn't at the time about um, using a torch to clean a pair of skis and, <laughs> and what happens to that pair of skis. So um, there's, some, there's some very humorous anecdotes it, in the book. The interesting thing, Sue, is uh, Ron Yeager, <laughs> the person that uh, melted my ski, um, was at World Masters this year, and I hadn't seen him since probably that day that he melted my ski. Yeah, we had these um, Hexal skis that were made out of uh, honeycomb, what they were using in airplane wings, we were told so. Oh man, we thought this was great. They were lightweight, but they were incredibly stiff and so we had thought they'd be good in clister. So we had put clister on. I was trying to get the clister off and I was having a difficult time. So Ron Yeager just grabbed my ski, <laughs> held the torch up to it and the thing just melted. <laughs> so it was, uh, yeah, quite a shock. But anyways, yeah. Well, thanks Trina. Why don't we move on now to the 1980s and 90s and um, we'll go back to Sue, who was the 1984 Olympian. And here she is in front, the picture, skiing, of course, always in the front. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> Sue, why, why don't you talk about how was training and racing in the 80s compared to what Trina was talking about and compared to the way it is now? Um, well, that's, this is a, actually a pretty great picture to, to show um, differences because this is from the 1985 world championship relay in Seefeld, Austria. And in 1984, when I competed in the Olympics in Sarajevo, Yugoslavia, um, we were still, everyone was still putting kick wax on their skis and using diagonal stride to climb hills and then double pulling and, and kick double pulling. And we were making use of a technique called marathon skating, where you had one ski in the track and one angled out. But as soon as the hill tipped up, the terrain tipped up, then you would resort to diagonal striding. Well, this very next year, um, skate technique comes, comes into play. Um, and so, and at, I had, Few of the women in this race, this is the start of the relay, few of the women in this race before the world championship had skated a race. I had skated my first race in a World Cup in Davos in December um, because my kick wax was not working. And, you know, I knew a, a couple, the woman right behind me to the right, that's Annette Bö from Norway, and she was one of the very first women to go without kick wax, if not the first in a, in a spring race. And, um, but really we were kind of inventing the technique on the spot in a world championships. And what's <laughs> funny sort of to see is, so there's a big change, you know, up into 1984, it's, it's classic skiing with classic techniques. And then, you know, suddenly 85, big change. Um, I'm still using, and, and most everybody there is still, we're skating on our classic skis, which are, you know, typically longer. We've got 
you know, a, a big classic ski tip. Um, now skate skis, the tip is quite a bit lower. I'm using my classic poles, which are, um, you know, now I skate with poles that are about 15 centimeters taller than, than those. Um, so it was a really interesting time to be involved um, and be inventing this new technique, you know, at the highest level in, in World Cup and World Championship races. Um, and, and skating has come so far since then. Um, there have been a lot of, we were using our classic boots there, uh, low cut boots, and, and now the equipment's, you know, very much gear more specific to the needs of skate skiing. So pretty fascinating time that I was involved um, in that. So what were some of the hurdles that you faced in your ski racing career at that time? Um, a lack of knowledge, I would say. Um, yeah, I, I was quite new to to cross country racing too. I had just switched in college, skied two years in college and, and then my first year out made it on to, got to ski World Cups. So, you know, I really did have lots and lots to learn and lots that I didn't know. Um, I didn't understand, uh, I really didn't understand much about pacing or physiology or training or recovery. Um, so that for me, and it's, I mean, in a way it's, it's been really fun. I've been learning ever since and I keep learning. So that's, that's a fun thing about the sport across country is that I, I feel like you can, you can keep learning, you know, for decades, forever on it. It's really, it's really cool that way. Um, so, you know, my own lack of knowledge was, was a hurdle. Um, and there, I've, yeah, there's a few stories in the book that I think demonstrate that. Um, but then, you know, some other changes that have happened that we didn't have. We didn't, we trained on our own pretty much um, between April and mid-October. We'd go to a couple week, two week long camps, but we were training on our own. Now uh, there's a wonderful, wonderfully strong club system. And um, most, if not all of the national team members have are on a club team and they have great support. They have great support uh, back at home. They've got, you know, great coaching there. Um, they've got teammates that they're training with um, year round. So that was really different. And I, and I think that that's really been a big part of the rise of American fortunes in the sport. Um, I think also there's been a lot of knowledge gained in, in training, but even more so in uh, recovery methods so that women can train harder and more now and recover from it and, and come to a higher level because of the understanding of the importance of recovery and, and methods to recover. So I think that's a really big change. Um, I also, I would like to think that the sport's gotten cleaned up. Um, for sure, there was use of performance enhancing drugs. Um, you know, during the time that Trina competed, I competed, Leslie, Nancy, Laura all competed. And there's been a real push to, um, try to eliminate that. And I, I think that, that it has gotten cleaned up. So, you know, it makes for a more level playing field. And all of these topics are covered in Trail to Gold. Do you, do you have any favorite stories or things you want to share from the, from the book, Sue? You know, besides, besides some of Trina's stories, um, really one of my favorite stories is from Laura. Um, Laura, talk relates she tells a story of being she's the anchor leg at the nagano olympics in japan uh that's what 1998 and um she's in the stadium waiting for her teammate to come tag her and she's waiting and she's waiting 
I don't know, Laura, do you want to chip in on this? Or go, go for it. You're doing great. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's really, it's fabulous. Um, she's, she's telling us what it's like to stand there, you know, all by yourself, the last anchor skier waiting for their teammate. And, and then to look around and, and to kind of take in the, the whole moment and, and just decide, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go out here and, and give it my all and do my best. And I'm, I'm proud of being here and I'm going to represent my country well. And I've put a lot into this and, and it just shows um, her spirit. And I think it shows, it's very, it's an example of the spirit in, I think, most of us. Um, and then, you know, with that determination, um, regardless that she gets tagged like minutes behind the next team, you know, she focuses and she's determined and she, she puts in a great last leg and winds up uh, catching, you know, the Canadians and having one of the fastest times in her particular leg. And um, it, it's, it's a wonderful passage. Uh, it's very honest and revealing and, you know, demonstrates the spirit that she has. And, and I think the spirit that, you know, we, a lot of us have. Can, um, if I could jump in on that. Um, I know I haven't been asked a question, but I just wanted to weigh in on that story and sort of the spirit of it all, because I really feel like having been a part of the construction of this, this book of um, wonderful accounts of skiing through the years, I feel like we've kind of gone from shame to celebration. And the fact that Laura was sharing that story and you know, the conflicting emotions that she had to be feeling at that time. I know I've been on a last place, really. I know what that feels like. Lester, you probably share that with us too. And it's, um, you feel, it, it's, it's a hard one. And I wanna just say that it's, this book was such an opportunity for so many people to be authentic about what we did and to own it <clears throat> and to bring it forward with celebration instead of, hiding behind it or coming up with, I know for myself, coming up for excuses for why, you know, I didn't do this or that, or it, I don't know. To me, it was an amazing thing. And the fact that Laura shared that was really a big part of it. And so many people too were able to come forward with stories that maybe they didn't feel like telling before, but because we were being authentic and wanting people to realize you know, this is what it was, and this is this is how it was. Um, I think that's a, a really big part of the book. And for me, that's what kept me writing chapters because I got so excited about the feelings that were coming through. And, and I know that so many of us bonded in the process and became the, the team that we really, that we, some of us didn't feel like we had when we were competing. And I know that all of us um, would, you know, we are highly, you know, motivated type, type one type, you know, we're just, we're motivated, hardcore working people, you know, and so to put us all together and, and in a team situation, it wasn't always easy, but it was easy in the book because um, here we were bringing it together with with this um, spirit that, that Sue was so um, importantly pointed out. So make sure that people knew that the process of the book was in, in incredibly healing. And I talked to in the process of, you know, learning more about the stories and the people and um, working with the stories. I, you know, got to know some of these skiers who I didn't know before and uh, it, it was extremely um, rewarding to be able to uh, construct these tales and, and weave them together and be, be able to bring, them to bring them out and share them with everybody. So, so Nancy, can I, I want to introduce you now, but I, want, oh. I just want to introduce you and then I want you to keep talking because you're saying such wonderful things. Um, 
This is Nancy Fiddler. She's a 1988-1992 Olympian. She studied and played three varsity sports at Bates College, um, graduated in 1978 with a BA in English Lit. Um, she worked, as I understand it, TRAPS um, after you graduated from Bates. And you began your Nordic career at Bates in 1976 with no prior experience. Uh, you competed at a AIAW National Championships, which were the Women's Collegiate National Championships before the NCAA took women in. Um, finishing eighth in 1977 and fourth in 1978. She trained and raced without affiliation or program until 1980. Uh, quit skiing and moved to California, worked in the ski industry and adopted the mountain lifestyle of climbing, hiking and ski mountaineering. Returned to skiing at the 1986 USSA National Championships and finished first and third. Uh, began a second ski racing career at the age of 30. Qualified for the 1987 World Championships. She was on the US ski team from 1987 to 1993. Competed at Worlds in 1987, 89, 91, and 93. As I said, competed in two Winter Olympic Games, 88, 92. 14-time national champion. Uh, retired in 1993 and returned to the ski industry in Mammoth Lakes, California. Her daughter, Laurel, was born in 1995, and she's now semi-retired from full-time coaching juniors, masters, and ski school program director. So Nancy, she wrote five chapters in um, Trail to Gold, so continue talking. You're saying awesome things. <laughs> yeah, I'm so uh, let me go ahead. Bring, yeah, go ahead. Let me just say that when when Sue was forming the book committee, I, I honestly, I didn't raise my hand. And I wasn't really sure, you know, I was still kind of hiding in my, I don't know, we all retired and, and had, unfortunately, you know, I kind of just had a little opinion about how I did and, and where I fit into the history of skiing and didn't really feel very important or that I had much to add. Um, I don't know. I think that's that's not a positive thing to say about it, but it's true. You know, some of us were we left on shaky ground and um, had a hard time coming to grips with, you know, what was that I just did and was, you know, was it worth it? Did I accomplish anything and so forth? And so I sat back and watched and then I was listening to Sue you know, do, Sue did an amazing job by pulling all this together. I have to say, Sue was amazing and she was an incredible leader. And just, um, yeah, it was just wonderful to become Sue's good friend and teammate in this project. But um, so I sat back and when Sue was asking for volunteers to write chapters, it was like dead silent. I mean, it was silent, silent. And so I went, okay, what the heck, you know, I... I can, I was an English major and I'd like to write. So I said, throw me the first chapter. I'll do what I can. And if someone can come up with something better, have at it. But I was so, so glad that I did that. I, I really feel, um, like I said, it re rewarded. The hard work was, was rewarding every step of the way and um, getting to know the skiers and their stories. And most of all, you know, you can, when you do something like this, you look at the entire timeline and 50 years is a long time and you can see the, the, uh, the perspective changed for me. And I was able to look at my own career and say, wow, well, we were skiing during this period of time. And it, it really was closer to the beginning than the end. And that was the first time <laughs> that I'd looked at that and seen that as, you know, we were still at the beginning at that time. And I had a, um, uh, kind of an awareness that, wow, you know, we did some stuff, we had to do some stuff that made the next generation's um, journey through ski racing just a little bit easier. And every generation, it got a little bit easier as, as we kind of figured it out and, and did some of the hard stuff. And it was hard for every generation, but it was like, sometimes bridges didn't have to be recrossed because of the work that came before. And I finally saw how that was all fitting into place. And I was able to have a kind of take a new look at my own ski racing career. And I don't know, I kind of felt a lot better about it. And also as people related their hard stories, 
I thought, wow, we are really all sisters in this and, and that we share this, um, share the difficulty of what it means to be a professional athlete. And, and it is difficult. It's a lot of, um, you know, you give stuff up and you, you, you go, you go places in your mind and in your body that you're not all, all the way prepared for. And, and I just feel like, wow, we all had so much in common. And, and it was, it was amazing to just see the bigger picture of that. And so, like I said, I wrote one chapter and then I was fired up. I wanted to just keep going. And if Sue hadn't assigned some of the other ones to other people, I might've just written the whole damn book. <laughs> but yeah, I'm, I'm grateful that that was the, the um, experience I had with the book. And I wanted to say that the materials that were submitted were, oh, they were heartbreaking. I mean, I was, you know, wiping away tears sometimes. And some of it was like full on hilarious. Some of it was just, you know, you just go, oh yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. So it was, it was hard not to include everybody's absolute last word that they wrote but I think we, we got a lot of it down. And um, my only regret is that some, some of us didn't wanna share and that's private and that's personal. But I, because of the great experience that so many of us had, I, I just, I guess deep down, I wish they could have had that same experience that we did. So I might be speaking for everybody else there, but I think we all really enjoyed the process. Hmm. Um, Leslie, do you want to chime in now? I'll, I'll introduce you as Leslie Hall. Sure. Whoops, let me get your picture up. Uh, Three-time Olympian, uh, 1988, 92, and 94 Olympian. Um, Leslie grew up in Stowe and began focusing on Nordic skiing at age 13 when Bill Koch won his silver medal in 1976 at the Innsbruck uh, Winter Games. She went to Stratton Mountain School for her last few years of high school to further improve her skiing and from there to Dartmouth. Um, Leslie competed at, on five world championship teams from 1987 to 95 and three Olympic teams, 88, 92, and 94. She currently lives in Washington State's Metau Valley, where she recently retired from leading the youth ski program. And as I understand it, Novi McCabe was one of your, one of your youngsters. And um, I wanted to, hoping you could talk a little bit about that, but I also wanted to know, like, what kept you going through three Olympics? Well, um, as you can see, I was lucky in that um, between 1992 and 94, they switched from having four year or um, having winter and summer games the same year and the winter games got the two year bonus. So um, it made it easy. You know, I had uh, six years to go through three Olympi Olympiads rather than eight, um, although I think I probably would have stuck with it if it had been different, but, um, you know, it just, I think everyone here would say the same thing that, you know, you have, you have minor improvements, you feel like you're making steps forward and it just think, okay, I can keep going. I want to make it happen and get to my goal, which, um, you know, since Koki won his silver medal, my dad was so excited and I thought, okay, I'm going to win a gold medal. So <laughs> I kept trying for a while, but didn't quite work out that way, but, <laughs> um, it was a good, a good, um, goal anyway. And um, a lot of these guys on the panel came to skiing late. I think they all did actually, but I grew up, you know, in Stowe, was very fortunate to be able to grow up alpine skiing and then Nordic skiing. We just started our family. My dad had been a four event skier at uh, UVM. And so he liked Nord cross country skiing and he took us out um, my sister Cammie and I, Cammie's the coach at Dartmouth now, we'd go out with our parents and tour around. Originally on alpine skis, we would cross country ski around the neighborhood, which wasn't the most fun, but um, we then got cross country skis and we didn't live too far from traps. So we could go actually ski at traps and then ski down the hill to ski home, which was super fun. Um, and, you know, so it just kind of became a thing to do for me in Stowe and that was great. And uh, then um, from there, you know, I went with uh, racing on the high school team and then got introduced to racing on the Eastern Circuit 
which was then called Eastern, not New England, and uh, went to junior nationals. And, and then that's where I found out that Stratton had this great thing. So I really wanted to go there. And that was great. Um, you know, really brought my skiing up. And um, that's where I first met Nancy was when we went to Gichigami Games in uh, 1979 in uh, Telemark, Wisconsin, which was like a big deal then for me. But um, I've been fortunate now after I stopped skiing to be out here in the Methow, great place for skiing, really. Um, it's like Vermont light. We have um, much easier, at least winter weather and mud season's way easier and uh, you know, beautiful spring and fall and summer's a little rough here, but otherwise um, it's a great place to be. And we have a great community of skiers. And I started working with the junior team when I came here. And then um, let's see, probably eight or nine years ago became the director of the whole program of the junior program. And Novi has been, I mean, Laura McCabe, her mom was my teammate on the 94 Olympic team. And so we are close, course close friends and we live a tenth of a mile away from each other and our kids are the same age so Novi and my son Walker were best buddies it did everything together from when they were very little and um, so it's been really such a great thing to have Novi grow up and and do so well and be um, yeah and you know I feel very fortunate to have gotten to coach her some and I also got to work with Sadie Bjornsson and Eric um, when they were juniors. Um, and so, you know, you can sort of see that some of these kids that have this drive to just, or they know how to race, you know, they just go out there and lay it all on the line. And, um, you know, there's that slight difference in, in them being able to do that. And it's been an honor to be able to work with a few athletes that have that sort of drive to be the best. And, and Novi, I have no doubt will go far. She, she is, yeah, definitely a racer, loves it. And that's all she wants to be is the best ski racer she can be. So it's super great to see her having success. Um, so that's been wonderful. Um, in terms of the book, you know, it's it was so fun to be part of it. And like Nancy, I was really fortunate in that I got to kind of with pretty much all the, the um, athletes the women that are in the book because I was searching out photos. So I would be in touch asking for photos or checking with them to make sure they were okay with the photos. And um, that was a good process um, and really, you know, kind of fun to have that contact with a lot of them that I didn't know or get to know them a little bit just through that. Um, and most of the photos I really like, you know, some of them, some, you know, I wish I would have chosen differently maybe, uh, and some were hard to find some, you know, especially the early era, Trina's era, it was hard to come up with some of the photos, although most of them, uh, Trina's compatriots were able to come up with photos that they sent me, which was great. And then we don't have the rights issue that we have with the current photos. <laughs> um, but, you know, now, of course, basically from 2010 on, it was like millions of photos of all the athletes, which is great. Um, and got to work with some of the great photographers, uh, Steve Fuller and Reese Brown, and um, this guy, Paul Sutton, who has a, you know, he's a professional photographer, been to every Olympics for ages. And uh, so it was fun to kind of, and Lori Adamski Peak, who was the photographer in our era, um, to just kind of, you know, get to know them a little bit and, and see their work and, and draw out what we could. Um, we paid for some of the photos. A lot of them were given to us for free, which was really great. Um, but that's where, you know, like a couple, I think Lynn Spencer is the one photo that I'm really sad about in the book because it didn't come out. She, she, we were going to buy a photo and she's like, no, no, let me send you this one. And it looked fine. It was just a photo that a friend of hers had taken, but it doesn't come across as well in the book. So that, that was disappointing to me, but um, I don't, I don't know if Lynn has a point in it, but I haven't heard, but, um, and my favorite photos, you know, some of the more current ones, there's just uh, awesome photos where you can really see the athletes in action. Like you can tell that they're moving and they're moving fast. There's a great one of Ida, 
going around the corner in a sprint. Um, Ida Sargent, that's really fun. And uh, Rosie Brennan, you just see the power. I mean, if you've ever watched Rosie Brennan race, you know that that's just all power there. And you really see it in the photo, which I love. Um, I was just looking through the book before this and there, Margie Mahoney, actually, who was one of Trina's teammates, um, sent a great photo and, and you can really see the power in her skiing there too. And those, those were the most, um, the photos I liked best. So, so yeah, that was pretty much my experience with the whole process. And I really enjoyed, um, connecting with the book committee and having their little check-ins, that kind of thing to, when I had the time to do my part <laughs> to feel like, okay, we're, um, it was pretty fun. So it's all been good. All right, we'll um, move on to Laura now, racing in the 90s and early 2000s. Uh, let me get the photo. Uh, Laura Wilson-Todd, 1994 and 1998 Olympian. Um, she was raised in Montpelier and attended Burke Mountain Academy. And while at Burke, she switched from alpine ski racing to cross-country skiing while recovering from an injury and began her first season winning junior national titles. At UVM, she was a four-time first-team All-American and the first skier, male or female, ever to win four NCAA individual championships by winning both the freestyle and classical races in 1990 and 1991. In 1992, she was a finalist for the NCAA Women, Woman of the Year Award. And after UVM, she went on to win five U.S. senior national titles, and she represented the U.S. at the 94 and 98 Games, um, competing in all five events at the 1998 Games. In 1999, Sports Illustrated selected Wilson 18th in its list of the top 50 Vermont athletes of the 20th century. And after retiring from international ski racing, she taught skiing in Sun Valley, practiced massage therapy, and found meaningful work in the local food movement. She now splits her time between Idaho and Vermont. So Laura, I was hoping you could talk about your, or start off by talking about your experience on the UVM team versus the U.S. team, like what that transition was like? Um, sure, I guess I, um, you know, I grew up as an alpine ski racer, so coming into Nordic was a much different um, team building uh, experience, especially with the Nordic team at UVM. We had um, some Europeans on the team the four years I was there, and they were a step up. I knew that there was a lot of um, just intrinsic knowledge that they were willing to share. And just by being around them and following them um, was really meaningful. And I think we all just loved that interaction. And, you know, as an, as an inv individual race, you're also racing for the bigger team goal of winning the Eastern Championships or the NCAAs. And I felt like, we were just so in sync um, pretty much for four years. There was really not, uh, not too many hitches in the giddy up while we were there. We were just on fire and we really enjoyed training together. We had um, super great support of supportive coaches and communities and, um, you know, just a lot of good like, let's, let's do this. Let's be strong. Let's work together. Let's, um, you know, I mean, one of my greatest races, uh, my teammate, sorry, stepped on my pole and we both went back to get it. And then we both worked to get back up to the top of the field. And, you know, it was moments like that, that are just, um, priceless for the UVM team experience. And honestly, it was, uh, it was quite a transition to, the ski team and mostly because we weren't together that often and so when we were together um it, you know it was always a little bit of getting to know each other and you know figuring out boundaries and um i actually love that picture of leslie that you just had up there because in my memory of heading out the door at a training camp she was it was if i could hang on to leslie for the first 10 minutes of the workout like I was in, like I could, I could, I could keep it going, but uh, she was always just so motivated out the door on time and um, right off the gun. So um, 
you know, I really appreciated all my teammates on the U.S. team. There were some that I felt we really were in the same, um, you know, just a, just a really wanting to work together. And um, it was a, it was a, it was a tough environment, as others have said in the mid to late '90s. So. I don't know. I'm, I'm really grateful for, for the people I was with. I mean, Nancy and Lester and uh, Betsy Youngman, we, you know, Ingrid and Laura, we really were a tight group trying our best. And um, I think there was a lot of unspoken um, respect and also that unspoken just personal frustration. And were you competing during the rise of the factory teams as well? You know, I wasn't so much. Um, I, I mean, I guess they were there, but I think I was on, I was at, in college when that was coming up, like the Bonnie Bell group. Um, I really only spent one year on the Fisher Marathon team and that was after uh, all of this. And I was, I was on my way out and I, I didn't know how to, how to get out. So I tried that and that was a good way out. <laughs> But um, I also, you know, after, throughout, like in 1996, I moved to Sun Valley to work with Allison Kiesel. And that was sort of the beginning of, you know, a club team that was called WIND, W-I-N-D, Women in Nordic Development. And um, that, you know, kind of had many ebbs and flows and, and ultimately turned into what is a both men and women team, the gold team in Sun Valley. And, you know, I think that we were really, you know, Allison had a vision and she, uh, as you all know, her determination and motivation is very high for um, promoting skiing and women in skiing. And um, that was a really big step in the, the rise of the clubs, I think. And Sue talked about a, a great story from the book where you're, in the 1998 relay waiting. Do you, do you have any other memories from racing with the US team, not either at the Olympics or any, any other race? Any favorite memories, good or bad, you wanna share? Uh, any favorite memories that are bad, did you say? Well, no, good or bad. Good or um, bad. Just from, from racing around the world, like what's yeah. stuck with you? Yeah, I mean, the, I do, I have some really wonderful memories from uh, Cross Gagora and Davos, Switzerland, and um, I, I went to Poland for the World uh, University Games, um, which was a really a powerful place to race. Uh, I guess, you know, it's, it's so much more than the start line to the finish line. It's um, really the culture back then for us going to Europe and having no way to communicate um, oftentimes getting to those places on our own and leaving our, on our own. Um, I, I do, I have numerous wonderful and like, wow, what do I do now? I am like, here I am, <laughs> you know, moments of just, okay, I guess figure it out. Just going to figure it out. So, um, I really love Davos, Switzerland. We had some great races there. Um, and um, Dobiaco and then, was really it's beautiful. Did was Keegan started racing? Her first Olympics was two thousand two. Did were you ever racing? Did your did your careers ever cross at all? Did you ever see her race or think like, oh gosh, here's somebody new and exciting? I did not know anything about a Keegan Randall in two thousand two. Okay. We never overlapped. I I really kind of. I when I stopped skiing I really stopped skiing I I my life took a kind of a big curve and I stepped away and I I did come back to coach and teach skiing in Sun Valley but I was not um keyed into what was going on with the ski team I, I'm gonna jump in on that Keegan Randall when I was coaching at JN's in uh, McCall Idaho Leslie do you know what year that was I want to say like late 90s that I think it might have been 2001, but I could be wrong. Mm, I think it was more like, I want to say 97, 98. Okay, could be. I saw her skiing in JM's and I just went, wow. I go, that's, there it is. That's the picture right there. 
Hmm. And it was um, just her fight, man. She, that little girl was really going. And I said, she is the real deal. And I will say that I also saw Sophie Caldwell at JN's at Auburn Ski Club. Um, maybe it was even the next year. And I, same thing. And I just, I was overwhelmed with the, um, you know, I'd seen it. I'd seen what really good skiing looked like um, while I, in my own career. And I just could identify it. And it was so amazing to watch those girls um, blast forward and, and accomplish what they did. Hmm. So um, I guess we'll take, unless people want to talk more or banter back and forth or ask each other questions, we can take questions from the audience. Um, hang on, we've got some chats. Uh, okay, we've got one question from the audience. For Leslie and Sue, who was your coach at Stratton Mountain? Oh, well, Sue was an alpine skier at Stratton, yeah. so she had some different coaches. And, <laughs> um, when I started at Stratton, Gary James was there my first year. Um, let's see, that might have been 77, 78. And then uh, Sperry came the next year. So Sperry was there my senior year, and then I did a post-grad year. And Sperry was there for a really long time after that So and did a great job. Sperry Caldwell. Yeah, I alpine skied when I was at, at Stratton and um, had a lot of coaches. Um, Dave Ogilla, Patty Boydston, Sumner Irby, a little bit Herman Golner. We had a lot of coaches. It, Stratton started as an alpine ski academy. Um, and I think it was only, I think the Nordic program just started maybe my senior year at Stratton. Um, and I think it was Gary James that started that. So we don't have other questions from the audience, so I'll throw one out there to all of you. Um, looking at the, the current team that started kind of building with Keegan in, in the 2000s, and then, you know, Jesse came on in 2011, 2012. What do you all think that they're doing right now, or maybe you wish you guys had known back when you were racing? Pretty much every time I, I think about it, it's like, oh, I wish we had that, like the center of excellence. Oh, if only we had that when I was skiing, if only, you know, I think it all, but they have their own issues, you know. Um, but yeah, I mean, they, I feel like they've got so many things going for them right now, which isn't to say, like I said, they don't have hurdles, but they, uh, you know, are a good team. They, they know how to, and Matt's helped them a lot, kind of work through how to be a team and, um different things like that. But one thing we had that they don't necessarily have, I mean, in those days when you made, like they would say, okay, you're going to the World Cup and the US team would pay for us to go to the World Cup when we when I was racing. Um, now, you know, like, okay, you can come to the World Cup, but you need to bring your own coach and you need to bring your own waxer and you need to pay your own way. You know, they, unless you're on the A or B team, you're putting a lot of the bill. Um, so, and in my day, if you made the U.S. ski team, you had certain things paid for, and it's it's not that way unless you're at a quite a high level now. So, that's what I think. Yeah, I I, I think I'm really um, I really think that this the training together piece of it, like it's already been mentioned, but I want to say that, gosh, I spent so much time training by myself and. I know when I was skiing that they formed a little group in Park City and training with Torbjorn. And I, of course, I was asked and invited to be part of that. But honestly, you know, I, uh, I had a husband and we owned a house and I just wasn't, I wasn't ready to make that step. But I did go to camps and I probably, um, that was maybe the most valuable time I did spend because I was hacking around by myself. <laughs> for much of the time. And I think that what they're doing now with um, the clubs and the opportunities where say you you aren't on the national team or you were on say oh, Rosie Brennan, you know, she, she was on the national team and then she wasn't. Um, the club was there to catch her when she fell and she still had people to ski with and she still had people who believed in her. And when, when we would have a rough patch you know, you kind of went home, at least for me, you go home and you go, geez, you know, okay, I got to try to drum up a way to 
rally so I can try again. And I believe that that's really helped them because nobody's ever going to have the perfect trajectory. You know, you're going to go up and you're going to fall sometimes and you're going to have a bad year. You're going to get sick or you, no matter what, you have bad years as you're developing. And I feel like that's something I wish, you know, we had had that mm, the club's just there to, to, for everybody to have that comfort and safety net for when, when they needed it. Plus all the training partners and the quality of coaching is extremely high all around, all around the country. It's not like there's just one good coach someplace. The, the advantage of having consistent, um, high quality coaching is, is really um, key to all of this. Okay, we've got some more questions in the queue. Um, can you, I think this might be, uh, might direct this to Trina. Um, can you talk more about how women were supporting each other as things got started? Did you reach out to each other or was everyone on their own? Everyone was pretty much on their own. Yeah, we, I just say I can't give Matt Wickham enough credit for understanding right from the beginning that women need support. You know, this team is so important. I was lucky to have Dave, you know, build me back up and then this incredible track coach I had. So, um, no, we did not have that kind of team support. <laughs> Uh, any anyone else in the in the who's racing in the eighties and nineties? Can you talk about were you, were you supporting each other? You reach out to each other? Or were you training on your own most of the time? I think um, one of the one of the tough things was like you always felt like you had to keep earning your spot, and you had to you tried out twice a year, you know, to have a shot at going over to Europe and. I think, you know, I think it's because um, they're the current team members, you know, they're, they're hitting high international um, performances. And so then they, they get named for the next series of races instead of having to continually come back to the U S and try out again. And um, so, you know, and that's, I think that's really, it's a lot of pressure. Um, it, it felt to me like a lot of pressure to, you know, to keep getting my spot on the team. Um, I mean, whether that is accurate or not, it was, you know, that's how I felt. And, and you feel like if you don't make it, you, you know, you have, don't have a good series of races at a tryout, then, um, then you're off. And then like Nancy was saying, you know, most of us, you know, you go back home and you're on your own. And so um, the club system is a wonderful safety net. And, and I also think just um, the difference in, in the way the current team members have been able to just know that, hey, I'm racing World Cup all year long. You know, I mean, I might, you know, somebody might miss a race because they're they're sick at the time, but they know when they start the season, they're not going back to the U.S. in the end of January and retrying out to remake a trip back over to Europe. And uh, you know, well, some of them are actually. So, I oh, mean, I think it depends what level you're at, but yeah. yeah. Good point. Um, but yeah, I think yeah, good point. Um, most, you're right, that the top skiers don't have to try out again. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I, I think it's really important that there be opportunities for sure. And um, like, I think it's important for the folks that are racing in the U.S. to feel like they have, you know, an avenue and a, and a chance to make it onto the team. But still, the, the trying out process, um, that was pretty, a lot of, felt stressful, a lot of pressure. And then if you don't make it, you're, you know, you're on your own. And then the hard part about that too, is that if you, you have to beat someone to make it. So there's just this inter yep. team stress about yep. people. I know for me, you know, I was always like at least seven years older, seven to 10 years older. 
than anybody else on my team. And I just, I think it just frustrated people no end that I, I would, you know, bump them or make a team at my ancient age. And I felt there was just a lot of unspoken, like bad juju that went around that I felt that maybe they weren't giving off, but yeah, you know, in order to make a team, you have to beat so-and-so and so-and-so. And and it just made it hard to be, to be good with each other. And we didn't have, oh, I'm sorry. We didn't have the skills to do it. I do want to say that the club programs teach the athletes how to be teammates so that when they go, maybe make an Olympic team or a World Cup team, they have some skills with them. And I know that during our Team Bonnie Bell years, um, Leslie can probably agree with this, we were a strong team. And I felt that that was, that was it right there. You know, we did have each other's backs because we were on the same club and we were actually kind of rooting for each other to make, you know, at one point, most of, you know, the, the uh, national team was Team Bonnie Bell. And we had done that work. And I only see it now looking back. But yes, we were, you know, we were supporting each other in the best ways that we could then because we wanted Team Bonnie Bell skiers to make this um, Olympic team or world championship team. And, and I think um, that, was, that was because we, we had that. And it was, it was Team Bonnie Bell, you read about it in the book, is, um, was short-lived, but it was, um, it was really great for so many reasons. So we've got people who keep adding questions, so we'll go to the next one. Um, how many of you are still ski racing? And is anyone not skiing anymore? I didn't race at all this year, but I have raced up until this year. But then I had some physical stuff going on this year, so I didn't didn't do any racing, but I still watch all the races. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm not racing hardly ever, but I ski as much as I can. And it's... Cross country or back country or alpine, just love to be out there. I ski every day, race on occasion. I, I ski most days. Um, I teach skiing. I love doing that and uh, occasional, occasional races, citizen races. I ski every day. I compete. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so next question, whoops, I lost my question. Do you think the current US ski team receives a lot more support so they don't have to work to support themselves now? Do you see the US ski team supports the women more now? Absolutely. For sure, compared to when Trina was skiing. I, as I said, I think, you know, they get maybe more, um, the top skiers, A and B team, get maybe more year-round support, help at camps and things like that, and um, time like that. And they also um, now, well, since we were skiing, I think when when Nancy and I were competing, they came out with um, internationally, you could get headgear sponsors, and, and that helped to open up sponsorship a little bit. I think now the athletes are maybe better at getting sponsorship because they've had results, and um, the team itself is more recognized. Um, so I had, Traps was my sponsor one year, um, so I was fortunate to get some financial help um, that way, but I think you know, it, it, uh, like I said, you know, we had some advantages as I see the, the skiers that are on the edge of the U S team. Um, you know, that's where it's the toughest. I think if you're not, if you're not quite making it, that's where it's really hard. And that's where the club systems are such a blessing because they can help keep those skiers skiing. Um, whereas before, if you weren't either on the team or on a high school or college team, you didn't have any way to do it other than shelling out a lot of money. Okay, question for Sue and Laura. Um, was What was it like making the change from Alpine to Nordic? And do you think that could happen today in a similar way? I know Liz Steven did it, but that was back in 2004, 2005. Uh, well, um, for me, I wasn't really, uh, I something I was looking to do. Um, I actually, like you said, I had an injury and it didn't, I had a boot top fracture and it didn't heal correctly. So I had to have surgery. And uh, it was when I was at Berkman Academy, I really wanted to stay at the academy. And they said, well, 
you know, why don't you Nordic ski, stay in shape. And um, at the time, John Sackett was just uh, hired to have a, the first Nordic team at Burke Mountain Academy. And so I joined him and one other boy, and he basically taught me how to um, marathon skate. It was right when we weren't, people weren't at, uh, classic skiing too much more. It was just skating that winter. And that kind of launched me into um, a whole different realm. I really had always dreamed of being an uh, alpine ski racing Olympian. And um, I guess it, my path was rerouted. And I, sh I for sure think people can change. Um, you know, it, can they get to that highest level if they have, I'm, I'm sure they can if they have the determination. And uh, if they come into it with a good alpine background, they'll really do well in the downhills. I mean, there's corners and those speeds that they're going now is, you know, fantastic to, to watch. It, it was a great change for me. Um, you know, I, I had wanted, I wanted to make the U.S. Alpine team and I really had worked hard and trained hard and, um, and I never, and, you know, I never hit many of my goals and it just was hard on myself, had a lot of disappointments. Really the highlight year for me probably was my first year at Middlebury when I was skiing on the Alpine team there. And, um, and we were a team and that was really fun. And, and we wound up winning the AIAW national championships. So that was a lot of fun my freshman year, but my sophomore year, um, I, I started running cross country and most of, you know, my friends were the cross country runners and they were also the cross country skiers. And uh, I was having a great time running and then um, ski season started and I just, boy, I just finally burned out on it. I was, yeah, I can, I can remember the exact moment, you know, I was training in Pico Peak, riding up the lift, thinking to myself, I hate this. And it was like a light bulb went off and it's like, why am I doing this? That's it, you know? And so, so I stopped and I didn't stop with the idea of taking up cross country. I stopped because I reached the point of hating it, but it didn't take very long for people to start talking to me about trying cross country. And, um, you know, I love to be physically active and I like distance. And so um, I decided to give it a shot. And I think what really helped me a lot was the Middlebury women's Nordic team was really strong. And so all I did was try to tag along and keep up. Um, and when you get to the chance to tag along and follow along good skiers, that brings you up, you know, pretty quickly. So, um, and for me, like when I started to cross country, um, I didn't set that goal of making the national team by any means. I just was like, you know, I want to, try this, you know, and, and so then when I did make the team, it was like this wonderful surprise and gift, um, you know, and, and, and I had had a lot, you know, I really had had a lot of disappointment in myself for years in alpine racing, and so then when I made it across country, like, I just, I just love the sport across country so much for what it gave to me um, and how it changed my life. And I just felt really very fortunate and, and blessed to have come upon the sport. And, and then just, it seemed like it suited me really well. Um, yeah, yeah I, I would agree with Laura that, you know, if somebody's got the determination, um, it's, it's possible to, to make that transition. And there are things certainly there are a lot of alpine training things that we do, we did that the cross country skiers have implemented, like more emphasis on strength, um, plyometrics. So there are some really good attributes coming from alpine training that are, you know, applicable to good cross country development. I'm just going to put it out there that Sue and Laura are exceptional athletes. And for them to make that switch um, proves that. Um, it's, it's just incredible what you guys did. And, um, yeah, it's cool. Thanks, Nancy. It was a, it was a gift.
for sure for in my life. Yeah, well, you know, same with me because I, the only reason I joined Nordic, well, Title IX had a lot to do with it. Um, the opportunity that they were trying to build a team at Bates and you didn't need to know how to ski to join the team, which, you know, that spoke to me. But, you know, in high school, I was on a swim team and I was a diver and it's like, they didn't have a pool at Bates. And so my first year at Bates, I partied for the winter and I, the second, my sophomore year, I went, I'm not doing that again. And when someone said, hey, do you want to be on the, you know, I could either be on the track team or the cross country team. And I just went, show me how to ski. I'm there. You know, I was so ready. And it was a gift for me too that way. Yeah. Nancy and I were kind of the bookends for a couple of those early years where I was the youngest new kid on the block and she was the elder like I'm back and I'm here for, you know, this is serious. And we ended up rooming together quite a bit, I think. Cause we, you know. Yeah, it, yeah, it was always weird being the old lady. And I, you know, I, that's just how it worked out for me. You know, how I took all those years off and came back. And so because I came back and I was just like, okay, this time it passed a count, right? So I was very determined and I didn't want, didn't want to waste it, but I loved it. You know, I did love it. So it made the work easy. So next question, um, how did you ladies find sponsors for your European competitions? I never found any sponsors except for my ski, yeah. you know, the ski sponsors, the uh, skis, poles, boots, and eyewear, you know, we all were, we had to have those if you were on the national team, but I never found a headgear sponsor or anything else and others did. I I think I wasn't as marketable as some of the other athletes, but um, yeah, I never really did. Yeah, and I, I mean, traps helped me out a little bit one year and uh, otherwise, you know, wrote a lot of letters and tried to, tried to market ourselves, but we really, you know, we would get some input maybe now and then from the US team on how to do something, but it seems so beyond our, where we were, you know, it, it was not directed at us personally and not always very helpful. So it was definitely hard, you know, unless the team was paying for a trip, it often was really tough. Uh, next question, were the men supportive in training or racing or traveling or in any way? Welcome well, to the I'll say um, when I was at, uh, UVM. Uh, okay, sorry. Prior. Wait a minute. Uh, when I was at UVM, our, uh, yeah, estimates no. and some commentary. I got to shut this off. And that takes us to step three in our process. Yeah. Um, anyways, the men, there was no women's team, and the men were very supportive to have always room in the van for me and then uh got so at the end of their races a few women would race and they would always um you know stand out and cheer and yeah they were they were great uh on the u.s ski team um again there was just was yeah they were fine yeah i think i remember martha telling a story though about how uh the men, the men would get mad. They wouldn't let the women ski on the tracks before they did because they didn't want them leaving sits marks in the tracks or something like that. <laughs> oh, that was just part of the, the part of the deal. <laughs> yeah. I think the the men on the team were um, supportive and friendly. You know, when I was when I was on it. And when we were, it probably depends on the men, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We had some good guys on our team. I, I felt we had some really good guys on our team. And I also, you know, when I was training in Vermont by myself, um, I was calling Mike Gallagher, who was a coach in Southern Vermont and Seamus Daly in Stowe. And, you know, I was finding the network and to, to have people to train with. And, you know, a lot of them were, were willing to let me tag along. Uh, so last question and then a couple of, uh, accolades I'll, I'll read, but, uh, were any of you tempted to train overseas where the teams were better established? 
For sure, I was. I really wanted to go over and train in Europe. And I, when um, Torbjorn Carlsen was coaching and I was talking to him about it because he's Norwegian and he's like, no, you shouldn't go be a small fish in a big pond, stay here and be a big fish in a little pond. But <laughs> I always, you know, wanted to, to go and try and learn what they knew over there. And actually we got to go, uh, Laura, you, did you go 90, uh, 93 fall? We went to Sweden and stayed there and trained for the fall, but we were just training on our own. We had a Swedish coach living in Östersund, Sweden, training. Um, so it wasn't like we were training with a European club, which is what would have been interesting. I, I, don't, I don't think we were connected well enough at that time. I mean, it sounds like you got it right after I retired, but I don't think we were that well connected with the Europeans to be able to just say, hey, you know, I'm coming over. Can your club host me? We, did, we just didn't have it, and, and we, I couldn't have afforded it. I mean, I could not have, I could, no, it wasn't an option for me, although it would have been nice for sure. I, yeah. wish, I, I, oh. I wish I had, um, you know, I, I think that that's a really, that can be a super valuable thing to do, but um, yeah, I was young and also, I mean, I feel like after a winter of racing internationally, you know, you'd look forward to, to coming home and um, I just didn't. You know, I, I didn't really look into it, um, but one thing I thought was really valuable whenever I could, sometimes even even with some of the men skiers, I, I would try to I would try to follow better skiers, you know, internationally every chance that I could. If a if a Soviet or a Norwegian came by, you know, I'm or a Czech woman, I'm jumping right behind them and just trying to hang on for as long as I can, trying to osmotic, osmotically glean as much ski technique from them as I could. Um, so yeah, I mean, in hindsight, I, I kind of wish I did, but. So we're almost nearing the end of our time. I just want to read, uh, they're not questions, but I, I, I just want to read what some people have typed. Um, an anonymous attendee said, you are all amazing with your honesty, especially appreciate Nancy's candidness. I can't wait to get a copy of the book. Uh, Kat Lane said, Trina, thank you for your guest appearance at my children's elementary club several years ago in Morrisville. You were so kind, engaging and inspiring with a bunch of third and fourth graders. And some of those kids just finished a successful Nordic season at their middle school. Uh, then we've got Suzanne King said, thank you for everything you shared. I especially love what you said, Nancy, reflecting on the healing and bonding that has taken place through the book project. I honestly never thought of my years of racing as a stepping stone for today's success, but now I see how there's continuity and that some of the low points may have proven to be good lessons going forward. Um, and then two suggestions. How about you all meet at the Berkey in 2023 and make a race together? And the last question is, who's going to make a second edition of Trail to Gold? So <laughs> Trail to Gold is available from the museum. I think Abby will talk about it. And um, I want to thank everybody for coming tonight and attending, especially these panelists. It's wonderful to see all you people, see all you, you know, inspiring heroes and, uh, Thanks for taking time to participate and to attend and listen to what they had to say. So I'll pass it back to you, Abby. Great. Uh, well, I wanna thank all of you ladies for being here tonight. Um, for me, uh, I think women in sports and your stories are super important and it's really inspiring. So thank you for creating this book and sharing your stories tonight. Um, each red bench is, is born from some spark of an idea. Um, and this one happened to be when Trina just came by the museum and handed me a copy of this book. And I thought, this, is, this has got to come to the red bench. Um, and if you know me well, you know that I will always try to fill the red bench with women whenever possible. So it's really, <laughs> really nice um, to see this come together. Uh, and I want to thank everybody in the audience. Uh, for tuning in. I really hope you enjoyed this. Uh, I would be shocked if you didn't. It was lovely. Um, and we will, I've seen some orders come in for the book. We will likely sell out, but if you are interested, just get in touch and we'll make sure that we get 
a copy in your hands. Um, and then I just want to say our, our red bench season and ski seasons are winding down, um, but we are working on one more red bench event for next month. Uh, so keep an eye on our e-newsletter and social media. We also have our spring online auction, which is full of vintage memorabilia and collectible items going live on Monday. Uh, and we should have a sneak peek ready for you uh, this weekend, probably on Sunday. Um, and don't forget to make your donations uh, to support this series and this event. Uh, your donation could win you a pair of darn tough socks. And that is it for tonight. I hope everybody has a great evening. Thank you, Abby. Thank you, Abby. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Peggy. Thanks, Abby. Good night.